All right, so that's kind of the legacy companies, but what about now SpaceX and Elon Musk? And, and really, it's kind of a different way of thinking and approaching the topic, which hasn't always been popular. That's right. Now, of course, Elon Musk at the time of writing is deeply controversial after yeah. buying Twitter. Yes. And it seems to be there are the fanboys who love everything he does. Yes. And then there are the people who hate everything he does. And uh, there's not much ground in the middle. That's right. But I think we can say here without jumping on one side or the other that in terms of rocket costs, SpaceX has been revolutionary. That's right. So what's going on here? Now, first of all, we have to acknowledge that SpaceX yes. could not have done this 40, 50 years ago. I mean, they, Elon Musk read every book about rocket design yeah. that was in the, out there and talked to all the experts and hired a lot of them. So a lot exactly. of people who designed the, the Falcon engine were people who had already designed many previous rockets for the legacy companies. Right, and just as Saturn V used the V2 designs, right? So is it, that's right, it wasn't a new playbook necessarily or new knowledge, it was built on. Yep. So one point is the absolute focus on budget and speed. Okay. And speed is budget in this case, because yes. you, what you're spending most of your money on is people. is people, not the hardware. I mean, the hardware and the fuel is some of it and the land, but the bulk of it is paying for people. And so if it takes 20 years rather than two years, you're paying 10 times as much. That's right. So and Elon Musk, when he did this, had, he was looking at one or $200 million, which again was absolutely tiny. It wasn't the multi... Yeah. billionaire he is now um, and so that money was going to run out fast yes so there was a real focus on can we do this on an absolute shoestring budget yes and can we do it really quickly that's right Elon Musk is famous for saying we're going to do something in a wild optimistic timeline which then fails to be met but nonetheless that's a way of pushing people to try yes. and do things much faster w which actually was kind of what Saturn V and the moon program did right yes. it was a wildly yeah. ambitious timeline and you spent a lot of money on a lot of people to do it as quick as possible Another part of it was so-called hardware rich engineering. I mean, I've read a lot of books about this to try and understand what's going on here. I'll put links to some of them below the video. And uh, one thing that they talk about is it's a hardware rich environment if you work for SpaceX. You've got lots of spare parts and lots of engines in various stages of construction. What this means is if something goes wrong or blows up, you just pull the next one out. Yes. But try telling that to an accountant. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna have 10 combustion chambers. Because we here. expect nine of them to blow up. They say, well, why not just do one properly? Are oh, you a bunch of incompetence? And so a lot of people coming from other companies talk about this hardware rich environment mm. that it makes it relatively easy to try things, blow them up and fail and keep going again rather than, oh, then we're going to build it again. It's going to be a two year delay, which comes back to the focus on speed. Which also comes back to the difference of the legacy companies, right? Which try to design it really well once without having a lot of that testing hardware. Which sounds to an accountant like a good thing. Why not do it once properly? Yeah. But you know, trial that's and error, not trial error is the, the yeah. whole core of the scientific method. That's right. And that's much better. There's a disrespect for regulation. Yep. And uh, SpaceX has got in trouble with on this repeatedly. Uh, and I guess if you think you're a regulator, let's say your job, Brad, is you are supposed to make sure that companies meet their environmental regulations yes. for launches. That's right. So let's imagine you let something go through and it explodes and dumps shrapnel somewhere. Yeah. What's going to happen to you? You're probably going to get sacked, right? Well, I probably will, unless I force you to clean it up and deal with it and pay me the fine for dealing with it. And but let's it imagine up. you therefore are extremely slow to approve things because you want to make sure it happens. That's true. And so it takes you 10 years to sign off on the approval, which means a company goes bankrupt yep. and doesn't launch the thing. Do That's you get right. sacked? Uh, probably, depending on who it is, I may keep my job, in fact. Yeah, so that, but generally the incentives for the regulators are on the side of they, they don't care if it gets slowed down. Yeah. We've seen this most recently with you and your COVID drugs. Yes, that's right. The, the, or in fact, medical research in general for new drugs, you've got the regulators. And of course, they want to make sure the drugs are safe. There that's been right. Horrible examples like thalidomide yes. in the past. Where, but that means it can now take huge amounts of money in 10 years to get a drug approved. Because I don't, res I don't re reply to or respond to them. I reply to the government or the people who are essentially employing me to do that. And that means that a lot of drugs are not getting developed in the first place yep. because the company can't afford that amount of money or they don't even start because they know it's going to be too expensive. Yep. And so people are dying because the drugs didn't get developed because you were being too careful about the safety. Yes. So again, it's easy to over-regulate things so that nothing ever happens. Um, Co-locating design and manufacture. Yeah, this is yeah. an interesting one. I mean, SpaceX in their original Hawthorne, California factory, the engineers were in a, basically in a box in the middle of the warehouse where they built the rockets. Yep. 
And so the people who are designing the rocket would walk past the people who are building them all the time. And, and whereas in most other that, companies, yeah. there'd be a head office over in one city and a manufacturing plant in another one and subcontractor somewhere else. Well, that's the same with NASA, right? We always picture NASA as Houston, but there's manufacturing design in uh, one facility in Steinis, and then you're come working with other people at Houston or Goddard. And so you're not in the same building, not working on the same problems or saying, why did you do that? And maybe finding some of those problems out early. And so the idea is that if you are thinking right from the beginning about how can I manufacture this easily and yeah. cheaply, and the people who are manufacturing and the people who are designing it are always talking to each other, then you can build simpler things that are easier to manufacture. Something that might look like a design, oh, that, that rock, oh, be better if we do this. Yep. But that's going to be a nightmare to design. Exactly. Um, a very small team of really good people worked practically to death. Yeah. And this is uh, reading the biographies of some of the people who work for SpaceX. They said if they work for a legacy company, on the first day they might get through the workplace health and safety training and get a badge. Yeah. Whereas at SpaceX, within an hour, they're sending off parts to be manufactured. And I, and I think this is one of the, the differences here. We always think of SpaceX, Elon Musk, which, you know, not taking any away from it, there was a lot of great, and still are, a lot of great people working there, which is also, again, very different the NASA, right? The goal of some of these programs was to employ people, to have lots of people working over many directorates. You want a small group of people working together at the same spot. Yes, so you know, Musk's philosophy is pick the absolute best people uh, and work them into the ground. Uh, he's famously not particularly empathetic to his staff, and it's probably not a good place to work if you want work-life balance. That's right. But this means, first of all, low budget because you're paying for less people. Also, the people would need to multitask. Yes. If you're going to work on a legacy company, you might be the person responsible for the bolt that holds the <laughs> yeah, right. pump in place. And your entire career might be specifying and testing and yep. designing that bolt, uh, which can be probably pretty soul destroying, I imagine. Whereas at SpaceX, you'll probably, you might be an electrical person, but you might end up throwing in for something else. You'll be designing a whole bunch of things. That's right. And you'll know about a whole bunch of things. So a lot of that internal communication That's happens right. within individual brains. Exactly. And realizing, oh, that design is going to be hard to implement. Uh, having a CEO, Elon Musk, who understands both finance and engineering. I mean, yeah. normally you get the engineering chief and the finance chief. And That's the, right. There'll be constant tension between them. But all, again, all the staff who work for him say that, uh, they said, look, we're going to have to spend money on this. And Elon Musk will just sit there. Okay. Yep. And it's just approved then rather than go through half a dozen committees and uh, uh, spending a long time because That's right. he both understood the finance and the exactly. engineering. How do you get a small group of people to work themselves to death for 10 years to do this? I think part of that is the fact they get so much, they can be part of something. They can, That's they're right. not just designing one bolt, they're actually jumping in all over the place. A bigger part on a really ambitious project, right? You know, as you said, no one's done it in 60 years. You're going to be the people that do it. But I think also the idea, people are always aren't clear whether his idea of we're going to go to Mars is yes. actually real or not. I think it is real. But nonetheless, the idea that they're going to be part of making humanity a multi-planet species, um, we've talk, we'll yes. talk later about whether that's a good or a bad idea, but that inspires people. And that's sort of thing that will get a young, keen engineer that, who might say, I'll, I'll, I'll give 10 years to this. That's right. Instead of, I'm going to I go work on the social life for 10 years. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they feel they're actually doing and achieving something. Exactly. And finally, we've got to say that luck is important. Yes. Yeah. I mean, SpaceX very, very nearly went bankrupt after the failure of their third launch. Yep. Um, the legacy companies were always very skeptical. They said, mm. we've seen lots of people come along trying to do this cheaper, uh, and we've watched them fail to make it into space. I mean, most of the other billionaires, there are numerous other billionaire-funded space, space yes. programs, none of which have achieved Earth orbit yet. That's right. Um, and so luck, getting there, it's, that counts for a it lot. It does. Um, if they're a small, if the one contract hadn't come through at a particular time, SpaceX would have joined the long list of companies that didn't quite make it into space. Exactly.